Well, you're listening to another episode and watching another episode of Community Corner. It's your girl, Trey Holiday, and I'm here with an amazing designer and architect in our realm, Margaret Knight. Hello, hello. Margaret, thank you so much for coming down today. I, I'm so appreciative. Um, we were just talking a little bit before the segment about how the work that is being done on the ground a lot of the times is in the shadows until we bring folks to light, right? This so is true. Tell us a little bit about your background and getting you started. In, in design yeah so I've been in Seattle a little over seven years now which is kind of crazy went by <laughs> super fast I went to school in upstate New York that's where I'm from mm -hmm. um, I went to school at Cornell there graduated in 2012 I did a little bit of work in Nairobi after that uh, the summer I graduated um, and then I came straight to Seattle uh, that that same fall. Mm. Um, and so I've had a couple jobs since then working in architecture um, First one was kind of a single family remodel type of situation where we were doing um, a lot of small scale work for families and then um, some commercial TIs as well, so some restaurants and bars. Um, but I was really looking for something that kind of resonated with me as far as my values, wanted something that was more rooted in community work. Mm -hmm. um, there was a tiny part of me that was thinking about doing the Peace Corps after I graduated. And so I think that part of me was like yearning for something a little bit more satisfying in yeah. my day to day. Um, and so I pivoted a bit and I switched firms to Schemata Workshop, which mm -hmm. is where I am now. And I've been there for about the last five years. Um, and really have focused more on community-driven design. Um, and so that's sort of what's gotten me out there, uh, what's made me feel like my day-to-day, -day, my, my professional life is a bit more meaningful and grounded in serving the people that need to be served the most. Absolutely. And it's funny because when I was in school, uh, like back in 2010, uh, I was doing some um, study around urban studies. And there was this... Um, this kind of notion about the need to be doing something more community driven, but it wasn't happening in a sense of like, you know, th there wasn't enough, I think, support around it. So what do you feel? How do you feel that your, you know, current position is really driving towards this community centered focus? That's a great point. And I feel like that was also lacking in my education. I mm -hmm. think there was just a total avoidance of the end user in general. Like yeah. we were sort of designing in a vacuum and no one was really thinking about like how are people gonna actually experience and use this space. Um, so work currently, I think the biggest way that we're actually pushing that agenda is advocating for community engagement. And mm -hmm. I know you've talked about this all the time. You are deep in it with the community outreach, community engagement. So you know how essential, how powerful, how impactful it all is. Um, but that's something that uh, we try to incorporate in most of our projects, um, one of which, which is pretty relevant to where we are right now, is the Central Area Design Guidelines. And mm. so that project, when we worked on it, we knew that outreach was going to be essential because this is a document that the community needs to help create so that they can use it to advocate for themselves when it comes to new projects coming in and being built um, around them. Right, right. So how does it work, actually? Let's say a developer comes in, you know, how are they experiencing that actual framework? So the way it is now, um, they have to go through the City of Seattle's design review. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, then they come and they present their project at a public meeting. Um, there's first early design guidance, and then there's des the design review board meeting. Um, and at both of those, there's a board that is using that document to assess the project and mm. to either approve it or to say, hey, you guys need to come back. You didn't look at this. You didn't look at that. The community wants to see more of this. Um, so it's really the one tool that they have to kind of um, push back on certain things when architects and developers come in and say, hey, we want to build this box. And they're like, OK, well, what about all these other things? I think it's so, so cool, to be honest, yeah. and and to, to, to be working in a city that's thinking progressively like that about community voice, mm -hmm. I think is, uh, I, you know, I think it's rare. I think um, there are certain models that are now being created that make it more scalable. Mm -hmm. um, with your work kind of outside of Seattle, did you ever feel that you were, that there was a focus on community at all in, in, in maybe in, even in Nairobi? I mean, was there yeah. a space for that? Yeah, for... Um that is kind of like a specific case because 
the whole um, the whole organization kind of their whole ethos was participatory design. Mm-hmm. And so that was like kind of a singular case where I chose that job because I, I knew that it was going to be impactful and powerful in that specific way. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, um, Seattle's the only place that I've worked professionally. So uh, to see community engagement kind of become this buzzword and the swell of people trying to understand how to do it and how to do it effectively um, is exciting to see. I hope that it's happening elsewhere, um, but I'm glad that it's happening here. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we've been getting some um, great kind of partnerships and just people reaching out uh, around this very topic, right? Uh, uh, something like uh, Boston Zujima Project. We were just, uh, just Aaron Tanaka was here mm-hmm. a couple of days ago um, and talking about the the need for community to be involved and even there in Boston they're being progressive with their um, economic model Mm -hmm. around it which I think is something that we're working on in Seattle there's um, Seattle People's Economy the you know um, and other uh, organizations that are really working toward bringing community more involved in the economy of all of this Mm -hmm. which I think is super important and I I wonder you know if if major developers are starting to maybe see this this trend and this shift in their work and if it's maybe changing them do you feel that you've experienced um, other developers who might be kind of thinking about this more progressively I think so Mm -hmm. I think there is I feel like we're on the precipice of this paradigm shift where even for-profit developers are realizing the benefit of having community support on their projects um just honestly from like a bottom line meeting the budget sort of sense because it's just a lot more of a laborious process when you have to go back through design over and over again because you can't get through design review and so I think that in and of itself is kind of something where people are like oh okay I get it you know if I if I get out there and I do something genuine to to show that I'm trying to get community input and I really want the community support Um, they will show up for me in a big way and I think everybody benefits from that especially the neighborhoods that these projects are being built in well I I totally agree and I I love the fact that there might be this this shift even if it is from that kind of bottom line financial standpoint but I do think that it's starting to open up more and more discussion and I think it also positions community groups in a really unique position to kind of be an intermediary between some of the larger developers mm-hmm. and the community, right? And mm-hmm. I know I experience that uh, daily at Africa Town, oh, you sure. know, the community <laughs> land trust side, because really it, it's it's um, you, you have to be connected to community in order to bring community out to an engagement meeting. Wouldn't exactly. you agree? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a great point that all of these organizations, these community run, community led organizations that are already doing the work, um, are becoming super valuable resources to these outside developers, designers that are coming in and they don't have the knowledge, they don't know how to get people to come out, they don't know who to talk to, um, so they're really relying heavily on these stakeholders to kind of help them steer the process um which is great but it also is like a lot of work it's a heavy lift for everybody (laughs) yeah it's almost like work in and of itself yes right i mean because especially in a place like seattle where there's so many development projects happening all over the place Mm -hmm. right uh i was at a a meeting and the department of neighborhoods did a, a presentation on um some of the standards right that are needed kind of the framework you're just describing mm-hmm and they were talking about how they even even in that they want to change some things because right now it's uh, the levels of community engagement showcase uh, the bottom is zero to ten people. Yeah, let me hear a little bit about what you think about that. <laughs> I, I think my thoughts on that align with yours, but obviously zero is is nobody. Yes. <laughs> And so there should not be a box for that. I mean, yeah. even to have one person, is is that really where we're going to put our bottom threshold? Yeah. Um, so there's room for improvement there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the, the elevation of it, and it, you know, I think, again, this is why uh, community groups being involved in those discussions about what that looks like mm-hmm. is important, right? Because zero is zero, one is one. I, I, I And I kind of feel like I don't know if the – 
if the bottom line should be 10 plus because you need, I, I think, uh, a good mix of community members and a good mix of different incomes, different backgrounds from community to really speak to certain things if, mm-hmm. you're, if you're talking about community engagement. And one of the things that I found so intriguing in that meeting really was that you know, folks were who are homeowners, you know, so they may be higher, uh, higher middle income folks or even high income folks um, who were feeling like, you know, hey, I, I get these postcards about this development happening. Mm-hmm. I've got no idea. There's no personal connection. There's there's no other information that I can glean from mm-hmm. to be able to say, well, am I going to go and engage myself in that process or not? And uh, just from your professional um, opinion, what do you think it would take in order to kind of close that gap a little bit between not just community groups being the interim, but you know, even when developers are first reaching out to homeowners and first reaching out, um, I wonder if there's uh, fact sheets, info sheets. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I, I'd like to hear what you may may think some solution to that could be. Yeah, so I think getting the information out there is key. Um, I think like a quick fact sheet would be helpful yeah. um, just because people don't even know the bounds of what is possible. So they're going to come to a meeting, well, what – what am I able to influence? I don't know. Yes, well, where yes. where am I coming in in the process? I don't know. Is it already you know really heavily designed and I'm just here to like help you check a box? Like yeah. it's those types of questions and it's a huge time suck for people. And so yeah. if I'm going to take the time to come to a meeting, I want to know that I'm actually going to you know make a difference in the end result. Um, so I think it's being really clear about the timeline for these projects where they are in the process currently and where they're going and how people can plug in along the way. And so that you know, okay, I there's a meeting coming up, there's going to be another one in two months, there's going to be another one after that, and this is what I can expect to see and comment on at each of those, you know, each of those yeah. points yeah, is really great. helpful. And it helps just the transparency of the whole thing also because I think it can seem really opaque to an outsider that – is not part of the process at all. Right. It's, it just can be a little bit cumbersome. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and this is why I think, um, you know, for us at the Land Trust, it's important that we constantly educate our community members, right, on what the phases of development even look like. Yeah. Because so many times, that's where there's a huge gap in, mm-hmm. like, knowledge about. I mean, you know, you're asking folks to come in way on, in on, you know, floor plans and things like mm-hmm. that. And if, they're, if it's not their background, that gets really hard to do. And, yeah. you know, you guys have done a lot of different community engagements. What do you feel has been some of the most successful tactics in terms of of like kind of getting folks up to speed to really give um, in impertinent and like inform uh, great great feedback basically mm-hmm. like so that they can be giving you something that you can really utilize. Yeah, so I think we've done a whole range of things. Some have worked better than others, and it sort of depends on the type of information you're hoping to get. Um, I think providing a lot of examples and having a really clear question for them to answer is helpful. Um, but the examples are nice because it gives them something to react to. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just this blank slate of like, what do you imagine here? or What do you think this should be? But here are a bunch of things that we've seen. What resonates with you? Mm-hmm. What do you think about this? What do you think about X, Y, and Z? Um, the other things that we've done um, specifically for the guidelines work um, have been to have walking tours, which nice. is helpful to walk around the community with with community members and hear about what they think about certain new developments. What do they think about the older buildings that are there? What is a character element that they do not want to see go away? What do they not like about certain things? Um, what streets feel safer? What makes them want to linger? What's a good gathering space? Um and so when you're actually physically there and you're having people take photos of those things, it's really easy for the design team to understand like where everybody's coming from with all of their feedback. Well, I, I, I think that's great. And, and to be honest, it really is closing the gap, uh, you know, for community members to feel a little bit more informed and to give some valuable feedback, right? And, mm-hmm. and not to just always base things on emotion, but to have some base. I think examples are great. Those are great examples that Mm -hmm. you gave. Um, Switching gears a little bit. Now, I know you're a member of the AIA. I want to talk a little (laughs) bit about that and your work there because let's let folks know who you are and what the AIA does. Yeah, so um, I have been volunteering with the Diversity Roundtable Committee for the past five-ish years now. Um, I was chairing it last year. 
Um, we've got some new chairs this year that are bringing a lot of great energy to the community, so that's exciting. Nice. Um, and essentially, we are part of AIA Seattle, which is the American Institute of Architects, um, and we're a volunteer committee that our whole mission is to promote diversity within the profession. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do that in a bunch of different ways. We have architects in schools programs where we bring in architects of color into schools of minority students to talk to them about architecture, let them know that it's an option. Um, sometimes we'll do some like design um, exercises with them. We've taken them on field trips to the University of Washington's architecture school. Um, we've also taken them to some of the more swanky architect offices out nah. there. Um, there are get them several excited here, yeah. about it. Yeah, <laughs> you know they put on like the virtual reality headsets yeah. and get you know get super excited about that. Um, so that's kind of one way that we are trying to boost the pipeline. Um, we did a hip hop architecture camp last Amazing. or just. A couple months ago yeah, yeah. yeah this summer right i know i was gonna say last year but this literally <laughs> just happened yeah um yeah so that was super exciting and that was the first year that we brought it to seattle and so we're hoping to do that again um at least the next two to three years nice. uh so that's in the works um university of washington's gonna host it again so that'll be great um and that was cool because it was a partnership with a lot of different entities so it wasn't just the diversity roundtable but it was also the noma chapter that we have here what's um, noma the national organization of minority architects okay uh so yeah so we're getting a northwest chapter going we're trying to get a student chapter going at uw also um and yeah so there are a bunch of other organizations that helped bring the hip-hop architecture camp together Um, Some of the other things that the roundtable does is to help kind of get the word out about what minority architects are doing in Seattle. So we put together an exhibit uh, a couple years ago that showcased projects that um, minority owned businesses were doing around the area. Um, We have happy hours, networking events, those types of things, just to get people talking Mm -hmm. and get everybody a support network um, because it can get a little lonely out here. (laughs) I know. I was going to ask you about that because that that was one of the things I was excited to learn. Like, I'm like, diversity roundtable. That's amazing because I know uh, the the one statistic that always kind of sticks in my head is, you know, uh, black female architects. 0.2%? Point two percent. I think we actually might be at point four now, ah, but don't don't quote me on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, Last exciting. I looked, there were four hundred and sixty eight of us. Wow. So, <laughs> which is literally a drop in the bucket, but <laughs> but still like the, progress. Yeah, yeah, and and I think it's through the work of exactly what you're talking about, being intentional. Yeah. Right about showing students the pathway mm-hmm. to what it looks like. Right is is one of the ways to break those barriers. I know we. We had uh, a design fellow here uh, this summer mm-hmm. that was helping us with our uh, hackathon, mm-hmm. our Minecraft hackathon, and our design weekend. Uh, shout out to Brie Taylor over there at Harvard. <laughs> Woo woo, uh, you know, uh, and and she was just so passionate and uh, young black female just enjoying uh, learning about mm-hmm. this. And she's, uh, you know, in her uh, higher level. So, it, you know, she's really excited to kind of join the workforce. Yeah. Uh, yeah how yeah. was it for you? Like your final years? <laughs> uh, you know, it's good. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's good. I think it took a while to to get that support network. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really key. I think you got to find people that you can have really honest, candid conversations with about your experiences, and it's really helpful if they're also having similar experiences. Yeah. Um, and so I've I've really found my community through the Diversity Roundtable. I'm super thankful for that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm excited for Bree. She's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she's awesome. We just appreciated her energy. And it, and it was funny because we got into many talks about, you know, the different pathways that you can take um, in architecture. And, and the fact that there are more and more people looking to involve community in these yeah. projects. To me, that was the most eye-opening, right? Because again, you know, studying urban studies, it was just like, this is the way cities are built. And this is, you know, this mm-hmm. is kind of the way that the, the population flows, you know, from a historical context. But understanding that now, even even some of the work that's being done um, nationally and internationally around design, mm-hmm. I think is important to note, you know, in this kind of, 
zeitgeist, if you will, you know, like it's a certain time that everything, you know, takes place. And it's amazing to witness this kind of time, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so, so let's hear a little bit about some projects you guys have in the works. What are you guys working on right now? Um, I'm actually working on some transit projects right now, which is a big jump for me. I'm usually doing affordable housing. Um, but right now we are working on a portion of the light rail extension that's going down to Tacoma. Nice, yes. nice. That affects my area, Federal Way, baby. 2030, so. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Got a little bit of time, but yeah, it's absolutely. coming. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I've been working on that. Um, I've got a couple other small projects in the mix, but, um, but yeah, that's been the, the big thing that I've been working on. Um, the office as a whole kind of has – a mixed bag of a bunch of different project types. Um, one of the big ones that we have under construction right now is the housing um, above the Capitol Hill Light Rail Station. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so we're working on that. Um, a couple of those buildings. Hewitt has the other two buildings on the site. Um, but That's a massive project. It is a big project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> it's keeping us busy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you mentioned um, Sound Transit. And before we close, I just want to say that, you know, I have gotten uh, several – Po- I, now I feel like I understand the postcard uh, theory, yeah. right? Because Sound Transit is kind of sends out these postcards about, you know, community meetings for folks to kind of give their input. Yeah. But it does feel really disjointed. And I'm mm-hmm. not sure what can be done in terms of roping um, South King County communities into that conversation. Mm-hmm. Do you do you foresee that there's going to be, since it is a long timeline, yeah. more opportunities for the community to give their voice on those projects? I do think that there's... There will be. Um, I have. I'm sort of dipping my toes into this project type and this client of Sound Transit, so I'm very new to the whole system and how their projects work. But um, I do think they do have some extensive public outreach time allocated. I know there's going to be like an online open house coming up for some things, so you don't even have to leave your house. You can nice. check out things online, um, which will hopefully be accessible to some people that can't take time to to go to a physical open house but Mm. i think there will be more um kind of drop in times to give your feedback as well so keep your eye out keep looking at those postcards (laughs) all right fingers crossed we can get a little bit more connection that's awesome is there anything that we haven't covered here today that you like to make sure the community is aware of um i think we touched on most things yeah um Happy to be a resource for anybody out there that's thinking about going towards the architecture path. Um, Yeah. That means a lot. Yeah. Because sometimes that's all it takes, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, hey, I just want to meet you for tea or coffee. Totally you know? open to that. Yeah. So so I'll make sure that we uh, put your email, you know, so folks can yeah. can have a way to reach out to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Margaret, thank you so much thank for coming you. down today. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a community, I just want you guys to know it's clear that there are opportunities for you to get involved in these projects that are happening around you. Community Corner serves as a medium for you to understand a little bit more about what's going on in the development world and also all of the people that are doing the work on the ground. I'm thankful to Margaret Knight for bringing her experience to light and I do hope you've been enlightened by all we've talked about today. Have a great one.